Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We have an amazing lineup of these three stellar founders. Um, I am Brianna Bannock. I'm the co-lead for VFA Women this year, and um, I will be the moderator. Today, we have Dr. Georgette Frazier Moore of Transformation Lead LLC. Um, she is also known as Dr. G and is a passionate, motivational, and thought-provoking visionary, technologist, innovator, and organizational transformation expert. Um, she's the president and CEO of Transformation Lead, a global technology and business consulting firm focused in driving and implementing innovative technology and organizational change, business solutions for enterprise, corporate, corporations, and government agencies. Um, we're super excited to have her on the panel. We also have with us Angel St. Jean, who is a co-founder and CEO of the Black Brain Trust, located in Baltimore, where she created a patent-pending methodology for measuring diversity, equity, and inclusion in companies as a software and a software platform called EquiScore BI that collects, measures, and analyzes comprehensive DEI data with companies. Throughout her career, she's built a reputation for being a fiercely committed, skilled, and effective designer, leader, and manager of system-level change efforts that scale impact, including having led system change efforts in Philadelphia and Baltimore. And as a Philly slash Baltimore fellow, I am thrilled that you have chosen those cities, Angel. <laughs> um, and lastly, but certainly not least, we have Bethany Stachenfeld of SunSpark. She is the co-founder and CEO of SunSpark based in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, SendSpark makes it easy for businesses to create and send personalized videos to strengthen relationships with customers at every stage of the funnel. And we're especially excited to have Bethany joining us as she is a VFA alumna and she started her fellowship in 2015 and worked at Filestack in San Antonio. So without further ado, I know we've had a little bit of hiccups, so let's just kick it off and start with the first question um, directed at anyone who wants to jump in first. Did you always know when you wanted to start a business or did an idea or a need come up that pulled you into being an entrepreneur? So I'll jump in, I'll jump first. Um, so no, I definitely did not know I was going to be an entrepreneur, not even when, probably even a year or two before I started the company. No idea that entrepreneurship was going to be the pathway. Um, originally, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. <laughs> Somehow, um, I ended up being a technologist. Um, and it became my career. Um, and I was passionate about it. So um, in, in regard to how my company ended up getting created, though, um, I was in corporate and I was doing a lot. Well, I, in corporate America, working with large enterprise, I was doing a lot of digital um, transformation there. Um, and then I started doing a lot of international consulting. So that's the reason why I ended up with a global international digital transformation company. Um, but there, I realized that there was a huge niche there for being able to effectively implement um, emerging technology into, into enterprise or into corporations um, to help digitize their processes, advance their um, innovation, help them help them think and, and, and um, come up with a strategy around innovation as well as um, actually putting it into practice. So in the midst of all of that, um, I was, someone reached out to me one, one day and said, hey, um, while I was still working in corporate, um, said, hey, do you have a company and do you have a team? Because I know your background and I want to know if you guys can do this for our corporation and help us with our digital transformation. That ended up being, uh, our first contract ended up being with um, Delta Airlines, which is one of the largest aviation companies in the world and helping them with their digital transformation. Um, and I guess the rest from after that was history. We just kind of, I was like, yep, the company exists. Yes, we'll continue doing this and six years later um, we're, we're, we're doing it for companies um, governments um, school districts um, and helping them really operationalize technology fantastic go ahead angel <laughs> i was i was just saying wow in terms of um, um dr g's work i'll have to talk to you afterwards um, but I, you know, for me, I, um, I definitely did not not think I would become an entrepreneur. Um, I was always very um, impressed and inspired by entrepreneurs. Um, I, you know, thinking back, I would listen to a lot of podcasts about entrepreneurship, just to revel in the stories of, you know, entrepreneurs, but never thinking that I could 
or would leave the security of a so-called nine to five job. They're never nine to five, but um, leaving that, you know, to be an entrepreneur. Um, but I definitely, I definitely think I was an entrepreneur and um, I was always sort of trying to innovate and create within systems. Um, and, you know, so I think there was this kind of natural, um, you know, kind of change for me, but what pushed me into entrepreneurship was um, definitely an experience. Um, so we talked about, you know, our company and we focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, my work had always been in the space of helping people through nonprofit organizations and government organizations improve their life outcomes. Um, so I was very passionate about that. I worked for an organization that um, I was doing this work at and they happened to go through a race equity and inclusion training while I was working there. And um, I thought, um, you know, I would say that I'm an applied researcher and I'm a person who uses data to drive results in programs and organizations. And so as a data person, as they're going through race equity and inclusion training, I felt I had this very important data point that they needed to know, which was that as a black person, you know, we did not feel like we were treated well within an organization. We also felt like the people that we served in our organization, um, which was 100% black um, and our leadership uh, was 100% white. And we thought there were some sort of blind spots that they had in terms of their understanding of the issues that our, our clients were dealing with. And I raised those issues in the context of race equity inclusion training and they retaliated against me. They tried to fire me. And when I had a lawyer um, negotiating my separation from the organization um, with the company's lawyer, our CEO got an award for his courageous race equity and inclusion work. And that situation showed me that one, there is no standard for what it meant for a company to be equitable. And two, that companies could be doing all of the things that they think would help them to become equitable. And it's really not. Um, and so I had the idea to create a way of um, measuring equity you know, in companies, which I didn't implement right away. Um, I left there. I went to work for the city of Baltimore. I had a fabulous job that I loved. Um, and then George Floyd. Uh, was murdered and everybody started to frame their work around economic inclusion and economic justice. And I felt that the same things would happen again because really there was no standard. Everybody started to say, we're doing economic justice work. We're doing economic inclusion work. And I'm like, you're not because I have been working with you for the last four years and I know that you're not. But because there is no standard, there's nothing to sort of help you understand and guide yourself along that path. Um, and so that led me into um, starting to explore creating a nonprofit organization that would help in this way. But um, I had a, 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 who is now an advisor, an investor, encourage me to go the entrepreneurship route. And um, that's what I have been doing since. So I can share more about that later. That's really impressive. Go ahead, Bethany. Yeah, on my end, I think I'm on the other side of the spectrum where I knew I wanted to start a company, but I just didn't really know what, like what I would actually do if I did, which is a big part of the reason why I did Venture for America after college. Um, and I worked at three other, or I worked for three years at, at two other startups and kind of the whole time I was working, um, I clicked really well with a coworker of mine. And so we kind of decided to start a company together. And then we were just looking for like, what's the thing we should actually do for probably like three years. And there's a couple other things that we um, try, like talked about doing and even spent like a few weeks or months working on. But um, in terms of like what made SunSpark, like the one that we're actually doing and now have been working on for over three years, it just, that's the one people really wanted and made sense. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like we decided, hey, this is what's going to be it. Like we probably tried like three other ideas that just didn't stick or work or, you know, you start working on it and you're like, no, there's huge gaps. No one will ever buy this. Um, so it was a bit more of like an iterative approach to, to really make the company. Great, I love how you've all had different experiences. That's really interesting. 
Um, so the second question we have, and I think I'm going to direct it at least to start to Angel, is how did you think about taking an idea and transforming it into an actual business? Um, so honestly, I had no idea where to start. Um, when I, I started out thinking I would create a nonprofit organization, I knew that world because I had worked in it my whole life. And so I thought you put together a theory of change, you, you know, get funding, you know, these sort of things. And um, when I, you know, switched to focus on um, entrepreneurship and doing it as a, um, as a for-profit and especially a tech startup, which I think is different. You know, um, I, I actually went into an accelerator and in that accelerator um, learned everything from how you need to do customer discovery to understand, you know, if people are really facing the issue that you think you want to solve, to understand their pain points, to really think about your product and, and how to um, make it fit what the need, you know, was, as well as to understand what kind of revenue model would make sense. How would you make money doing, you know, what you wanted to do? Um, and I think without the accelerator, um, I'm, I mean, I'm sure I would have sort of found my way, um, but the accelerator really helped to put it all in perspective in one place at, you know, at one time. And I, I highly recommend accelerators um, for, for any kind of business really. Um, but I think in one of the early um, uh, seminars we had, uh, one of the speakers broke down the difference between sort of a traditional business and a startup and, you know, really helping you to distinguish whether or not a startup was the route, you know, that you would take. And um, so it kind of helped me like take, you know, each, you know, subsequent step um, going through that process. And, and at the end of it, um, you know, the idea of the accelerator is that you're going to start a business. And I think it wasn't until the end of the accelerator and I was like, oh, wait, like the expectation is that I'm going to start a business now. And that was terrifying. Um, but I think um, I realized that I had a solid, you know, plan. I had a product that it was clear that people wanted and needed, that they'd be willing to pay for. Um, and it was just, you know, a matter of me jumping off the ledge and, you know, sort of making it happen. And um, so I, I think the accelerator, you know, was an important, you know, start for me. Um, but I think it's really, you know, the ideas and the concepts that were introduced to me, you know, in that in terms of really understanding the product and understanding the, the need in the marketplace and how it would fit. Um, I think that's probably the most important step to starting any business. Really interesting. Does anyone else want to jump in on this question or would you like to move to another one? I'll take the crickets as, oh, Bethany, you look like you want to talk maybe? I was going to say, I don't have anything to add. I think that was... Okay, awesome. Um, I, I think your answer was really interesting, Angel. I, I know I've personally gone through an accelerator and I think it's a really useful way to get to know like how to actually go about the business process because um, I studied entrepreneurship and even though I still know it, it's like, how do you do it for this specific idea? Like you might get the concept, but actually transforming the idea you're currently working on is, is a different different challenge. Yeah. So the and it's a journey, you know, oh, it's a journey. You, you, yeah. you start out, you take that first step and then there's a lot of learning as you go and you have to be comfortable with learning as you go. Um, and I don't, I don't think everybody's comfortable with that, but knowing that it's not supposed to be perfect, there's not a perfect route to get from point A to point B, you just kind of have to feel your way through. Angel, yeah. I think you hit that spot on because you can learn as much as you want in theory and in books, but when you're actually in it as an entrepreneur, that is a whole different beast of being able to say, okay, well, you know, it's harder when you're in the thick of it versus on the outside, or even if you're in the organization looking in to be able to come up with that strategy of operationalizing something like a whole business and all the pieces that go towards making it happen. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so the next question that we have is, the idea of funding is one that every entrepreneur faces. 
how did you navigate this? And are there resources you'd recommend um, every entrepreneur or especially VFA entrepreneurs consider? And I'm gonna direct this one towards Bethany, if you would like to kick it off. Yeah, sure. Um, oh, so funding is, I think one thing people don't understand right away is that there's so many different options for funding. And the one everyone talks about is venture capital, um, but not every business is made for venture capital, nor should it be. So I think early on, it's important to decide if you want to go down the venture capital route and knowing that that means it's like a lot of pressure and your goal has to be to build a billion dollar company. And if it's not that, that's totally valid, but there's other options. Um, and even if you do an Excel, like you know, there's a lot of different types of accelerators, but a lot of the main ones that you hear about, like they are expecting you're gonna raise money at the end and kind of go down that route, um, which I think is, you know, it, it's cool. That's kind of the route we decided to take, but then even getting there, you have to think about like, how are you gonna have enough traction and metrics to convince investors that you're gonna be a billion dollar company. And it, it can, there's so many different ways that you can just try to get money in the company. So some things we've done, um, one is just of course getting customers and people that are willing to pay, especially annually or like prepayments to start things off. So you have the money to, you know, pay people to work and build out the product more. We also have sold like lifetime deals. So we were able to bring in maybe like $200,000 pretty early on by selling people like, okay, we know not everything's built yet, but if you pay now, then you'll have lifetime access to our platform. Um, and then depending on your business type, like we've done some pitch competitions. Um, I think those work better. Those don't work as well for like software in the space we're in. Um, for us, we, we were able to, to get money from like local pitch competitions in San Antonio where they're excited to have companies build there. But I think the people who do really well in pitch competitions are more of like the social impact type of businesses. Um, so it's kind of a long winded answer, but I think you just have to figure out what kind of business are you and like try to get the money in a way that other people in that industry work like do. Because if you try to go out and venture capital, but you're building an agency, like it's just not gonna work. Um, but there's other ways you can fund your startup. Did you have a different experience, Dr. G? Well, actually, I definitely had a different experience because I didn't. Um, but but what Bethany touched on was key. I think making sure you educate yourself on all of the options out there, because a lot of people don't understand the types of options out there and what's available for their business and how to pair what's really going to be good for them. I've seen a, a, several businesses go through the venture capital route, and it really wasn't what they wanted in the long run. And then they end up in a really bad situation, try to manage their business with all of this pressure and influence of the venture capital capital um, that, that, that venture capital brings with it, right? Um, I, I, because, uh, you know, from our origin, origin story, I didn't plan on starting this business. We started the business with our first client. Um, and, we, you know, for, for me, I didn't start looking at capital until a couple of years down the line after the business had already started and I wanted to scale and grow. Um, and I needed to figure out what that could look like and what options were there. Um, I had the benefit of being a former um, banker in, in one of my previous lives. So I did understand a lot of the options, but not from the entrepreneurial perspective of being able to say, how do I start this thing? Um, but I did, so the only thing I would probably say outside of the venture capital piece that you kind of touched on in a very, in a very you know, detailed way, um, the part of leveraging like the Small Business Association for credit um, and being able to establish credit for your business and being able to leverage low cost funds to be able to go the loan route um, is, is another great way to fund a business. Um, and there's tons of strategies that you can learn to be able to build your business credit um, so, that it, so that you don't have to necessarily have personal um, you're not personally liable for, for the funds that you're borrowing to help for the business. You can create the business in itself as an entity that allows for it to be able to substantially borrow for itself, which is another um, great opportunity. So um, that's all I could probably add to it. I mean, there's still outside of um, bank funding or SBA funding and venture capital, there's still a ton of other ways that you can get, you can fund your business. So doing that work, like Bethany said in the beginning to learn what those options are and pairing it to how you want to grow your business is, is key, I think. And I think that that point 
um, that Bethany made about, you know, you have to understand what kind of business you have. And there's different funding routes that you go for that type of business. You know, if you are trying to create a startup, then the VC world um, is uh, the place that people do direct you towards. And it's this whole idea of I'm trying to create a billion dollar business. And like the emphasis is on that. I want to be clear about that. Like, you know, they want to know, do you see yourself getting to a billion dollars in revenue? And if not, then VCs are not interested. Um, and so if, you know, having a business that makes $500 million, you know, is perfectly okay, but just not, you know, the space that you, you know, want to start at in terms of the VC world. And I think for us, we went the VC route because of, you know, a tech startup and all of that. Um, and I think even within that, you have to understand um, what comes with, you know, when you talk about the pressure of all of that, um, one, raise because you need the money, not because, you know, you see a lot of stories about this company raised $100 million and this will raise, you know, all of this, these big raises, these people are giving away their company, like with every, you know, investment. And so you have to know, like, do, am I willing to give up equity and control of my company, you know, in exchange for this money? Um, and so I think raising when you need it, not because it seems like a cool thing to say that you've raised a lot of money. And then um, I think also, you know, starting with your local ecosystem, um, Bethany talked about that, I think people in your ecosystem have a vested interest in, in creating companies that are going to grow and create jobs and all of that. And so there's these different networks of people, investors, they try to, you know, connect you. Um, and picking the right investor. Um, we have raised um, just about a half a million dollars and that's what we've needed so far. We're actually going into another raise right now, um, but we have really great investors who believe in what we're doing, who believe in us, who gave us really great terms. And we have turned down money that didn't have great terms and that was gonna attach us to an investor that we didn't, sink well with and that was going to put a lot of undue pressure on us drift us away from the mission that we're about and so I think it's really important to one again understand what kind of business you have and what kind of funding routes make sense and then two you know within that make the choices that are good for your business um, not what's good for you know LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever. Yeah. And I'll like second that about making sure you have really good investors um, because look, we, we love ours. We have really good relationships with them, but I've seen that go so south for other companies. And it's once you choose your investor, you're really tied in with them. And like, yes, you can go through like legal to break up with them in the future, but that's a whole mess that you just don't want to get into. So, you know, it might seem nice if someone's offering you money, but it, it's not going to be worth it if you don't have the same value alignment as them. Yeah, it's like a marriage, huh? <laughs> wow, you guys all have lots of experience and insights in that. Thank you for sharing. Um, I want to make sure we get to Deb's question in the chat. Uh, so it's, how do you balance expectations for growth versus realities of pace of change with business, markets, consumers since COVID? Um, I know this is definitely something that the company I work for is experienced and, and I'd love to, to hear how you guys have handled it or, or if it's impacted you positive, negatively, um, what's going on in your world. Anyone can jump in. I mean, I'll say for me, um, we so we started during the pandemic and I, I think that is somewhat easy to do when you're in the early stage of creating a technology company um, because it's all you know sort of on a computer. Um, it, it also created opportunities for us to connect with people that we otherwise would not have been able to connect with because everybody was meeting virtually. So I could meet with somebody in a different part of the country. I could meet with somebody you know right here um, in Baltimore like um, you know, one hour apart from each other. And I don't, you know, people weren't really doing that um, much prior to the pandemic. Um, and I think because we also had, you know, all of the, the social, you know, issues related to um, George Floyd's, you know, death after, 
you know, occurring around the same time, there was a lot of interest in the type of work, you know, that I do. Um, but, you know, people, I, I think in terms of a, a trend, there are questions up front. So this was like fall of 2020, right after, you know, that had happened. So everybody was paying attention to it. But the question was, is this something that's going to be sustained? Like a year from now, are people still going to care about this? Or is it, you know, just sort of the hot thing for the moment? And then it's going to be another news cycle. And then we're going to all move on from this. And so investors were, start, was, were saying, do I want to put money into this thing right now? It, it might be something that's needed, but will companies pay for it? You know, can you really get to that billion dollars? Um, and so I think, I, you know, these circumstances work out, you know, in, in terms of the type of business that we have and um, the issues that were going on. Um, and I think I've seen a lot of other businesses that have either gone away or have pivoted into other, you know, ways of doing their business. Um, and so it really is um, important for, I think, the leader to think about what is happening. Like we had to be able to position our products in a space where people were questioning what the market is going to really be able to do, you know, a year from now. And, you know, I had an understanding of what had been happening in the space and sort of what was bubbling up. And so I had insights into what I thought was happening in the space that investors who didn't know my work, you know, didn't necessarily know or get or understand. And so I was able to kind of stick with it. And then, you know, here we are almost two years later and, you know, we're still increasing in the space and that has paid off for us in terms of staying, you know, knowing what was going on, not just, you know, listening to, you know, other people, but knowing what was going on in our industry and kind of riding that whole thing out. Um, so I, I think you just have to know your space. And I think, um, we, you know, we had to stay alive. That's the whole thing. You know, while, while people were figuring out that, you know, this stuff still matters, we had to stay alive long enough to be able to, you know, get to the point of people wanting to invest more, you know, in our company so that we can go to the next level. And so you have to be strategic about how you use your resources um, in order to, you know, survive, you know, that, that, that spill. And so it's paying attention to, the tea leaves, you know, being, you know, strategic about the resources that you have and understanding the milestones that you're trying to get to with the resources that you have. Um, so that's been, that's been my experience. Yeah, I would agree um, to what you're saying. We also started, I mean, we started right before COVID. So for the whole, I, I don't, I can't really compare things to like pre-COVID since that's been most of our existence. Um, but I think like a, a key thing is just like knowing what the milestones are and being able to show progress, even if it's not a certain, even if that number isn't necessarily revenue and that's maybe not what's consistently going up. But if you're saying, hey, we're focused on retention, we're focused on usage, we're, we're focused on these metrics that we've chosen for ourselves and these milestones, and then you can show that you're making progress towards that, um, then that's, you know, no matter if it's COVID or some other event that's affecting markets, I think you just need to be able to show that you know what you're doing, you have a plan, and you're making progress on that plan quickly. Yeah, I think Bethany and um, Angel touched on some of the key things, that strategy piece, making sure that you're sticking to your strategy. And Angel also mentioned being able to pivot if you realize it isn't working. So, you know, if you're keeping your ears to the ground and understanding what's happening in the, in the, in the industry and not, um, when I say ear to the ground, make that also, I would probably want to add making sure that you are not just so engulfed in your business that you're not paying attention to what's happening around the world, so around you, so that you are able to make sure that your, your company is remaining relevant and being able to make sure that you are um, open to, to changing and transforming while you're growing to make sure that you're, you're provi really providing value, not just in what you thought was the idea, but your ever evolving idea. I always take, think use that example of Kodak because Kodak was a multi-million dollar company employed 75,000 people back in the 80s. And the reason why Kodak lost its volume, um, and at that point they were they were leading in the in the in the photography industry. Um, and they were an innovator. They came, they actually came up with digital pictures first. 
but they did they decided they didn't want to act on it because they wanted to send um, they wanted to sell chemicals and they thought that chemicals was going to be something that was going to last forever to be able to develop pictures in a dark room and they never embraced the idea of digitization even though they came up with it and, and I, think, I think that's the key part of understanding that even though, you know, even though you have a really great idea and it's working really, really well, if you really tap into what's happening in the world around you, look at the problems and look at where the, the industry is going, you're able to keep your company in a, in a very strategic position to be able to move, um, you know, progressively and help to innovate and, and transform as the world transforms around you. Wow, great insights from all of you. Thank you. Um, we have actually one minute left now, so I want to do a quick power round of like 10, 15, 20 seconds each on any advice you have for someone thinking of starting a business today. Um, let's just kick it off with Dr. G. All right, so what would I say? I would say um, make sure that you are open, I, I, I piggyback on my last idea, making sure you're, you're, you're ready to, to not just learn everything that you need to know, but keep your ear to the ground so that you're able to transform your business while it's growing. I think that's, that's key. Um, for me, I, I say do it. Um, you know, there's a lot of fear associated with starting a business and um, well-founded, um, but I think uh, for me, it was like, do I want to look back and regret or am I going to, you know, try this out? And if it doesn't work, like I'm going to learn amazing lessons, meet amazing people and be better positioned for the next opportunity because of everything that I learned. Um, so I think it's important for us to bring our imaginations and our ideas into the world. You never know how it's going to catch and, you know, the impact that you'll have. So do it, do it. Yeah, Angel, that there is real. <laughs> yeah. Um, I agree. My advice is people say startups are risky and I think startups are risky, but starting a startup is not that risky because worst case, it doesn't work out. You shut it down. No one even remembers two weeks later and you do something else. So I think if you have an idea, just try it out and it'll either stick or it won't. And either way, you're going to learn something and at some point it's going to stick. Great advice from all of you. Thank you so much. I can't express how grateful we are that you all joined us this morning. And um, I, I really hope you enjoy the rest of your day and, and we, we thank you for joining. <laughs>